Our next speaker is Sen Tiao from Bank Credit Analyst. It's an independent research company in Montreal that we actually pay a lot of money to help us. So they don't make money on us trading your stocks. We have to pay them, and if they don't deliver, we wouldn't pay them anymore. But right. we've done for a lot of time, long time. <laughs> and you're one of the pillars of the company now because you've been there for almost 20 years. And we have listened to a Chinese specialist today. You shouldn't expect one more. He knows China as well, of course. But he's, uh, Chen Ed is the global investment strategy of yeah. bank credit analysts. Yeah. Chen, welcome back in Copenhagen. And the the floor is yours now. Thank, thank you. you. Um, uh, thank you. F uh, actually, this is the third time um, I speak at this conference. So I see some familiar faces. Um, I, I thought it was useful to refresh what I said last year. I think last year I described the heat map of the world economy. I described how China becoming too hot how Europe become too cold, and, and why U.S. is in the middle. It's a sort of warmish temperature. I further said that it, this sort of a heat map justify an outperforming U.S. stock market, an outperforming emerging market currencies, and an outperforming German Bund, which is not bad. And then I also said, that's, that's where the interesting part comes from. I also said the S&P 500 will end the year flat. I got it more or less right, but for the wrong reason. I thought, I thought at the beginning of last year that the stock market would go up and that we're going into a shakeout in the second half. But the reason, reason for the shakeout is because the U.S. economy would grow too strong and then the causing a blow up in the bond market that's going to drag down stock prices. So we got the right, we got the market right, but for the wrong reason. This year, I try to get it right for whatever reason. Okay. Um, I'm going to make three uh, quick comments. It's been a long day. Uh, I don't want to sort of drag this thing on for too long. I make three quick comments. The first thing I have to say a few words on the Eurozone debt crisis, because we have to understand how that crisis is going to play out. It is still a very important thing. The second thing that I'm going to make a comment on is the U.S. economy. The behavior of the U.S. economy is a very important whether we're going to have a, another period of a slump or better than expected surprises. That matters a lot for stock market. And the third thing that I'm going to talk about is how to make some money, or at least how to lose a little bit less. Um, to be exact, where to put your money? Buy what? Sell what? On the first subject, the Eurozone debt crisis, it is still going. I don't remember whether you, I don't know whether you remembered or not, last year I said the Eurozone debt crisis is a solvable crisis. It is still a solvable crisis. The reason I'm saying that is that it's a local currency debt crisis. I have never seen a real debt crisis in local currencies that has really blown up. The reason is very simple. If a country does not owe foreign currency debt, its central bank becomes effective guarantor of the liability of the government. Think about Japan. I keep using Japan as an example. Japan's public sector debt and deficits are higher than any country on the face of this earth. Japanese bond yields is about 1%. Where's the crisis? The reason is Bank of Japan is always ready to monetize. If you look at this chart, the first one, if you think about the United States and UK, United Kingdom. Their public finance actually is worse than Eurozone as a whole. I'm not talking about Italy. I'm not talking about Greece. I'm talking about the Eurozone as a whole. These two countries' public finance is way worse than Eurozone. And yet, there's a little crisis. Just look at the bond yield. Look at the U.S. Treasury yield. Look at the U.K., the gilt yield. 
The difference here is the first panel here. If you look at the first chart, it's aggressive, active monetization that saves the day. I hate ECB. I used to really hate ECB. I call them just about anything. I, I describe, you know, in really terrible terms about that without using profanity, but it's, it's really bad. And then now I am having a second thought. I think ECB probably is doing a better job than I thought, actually. They are doing a good job. If, if, if you think about it, I, as an investor, I want them to come in and monetize. I know if ECB comes in and making a open-ended commitment to buy distressed debt. The spread in all these troubled countries will collapse literally overnight. But the thing is, do you, if, if I were to run ECB, do I really want that to happen? No. If the spread collapsed to pre-crisis levels, the pressure will be off. No country will do f public sector restructuring. The Italian is going to walk away. The Greek is going to walk away. You're going to leave a big mess right there. Remember, the bond market is the only mechanism through which the authorities can sustain some pressure on these countries to restructure. So that's, that's why I think ECB has been very reluctant to come in to buy all those distressed debt. At the same time, ECB has to safeguard the banking system stability if, because if you have a Lehman type of fallout, we're toast. The entire Eurozone economy will toast. The whole world economy is going to fall apart. So they can't not allow a Lehman type of fallout to happen. So the ECB dealing with two objectives, which are in a constant conflict. On one hand, to safeguard the banking system, it, re it would require ECB to act as a lender of last resort. At the same time, to sustain the pressure for the government to restructure, it does not allow them to do that. So they have to design and come up with something that has basically been able to achieve these two objectives. I think this long-term re re repurchasing, long-term repo operation LTRL is a fantastic scheme that actually serves both purposes. On one hand, three-year repo, unlimited. The ECB balance sheet has gone through the roof, 800 billion euros in a day. It's unambiguously quantitative easing. At the same time, at the same time, because it is a repo operation, the, lend, the borrowing banks have to assume the ultimate credit risk. So if there's some default, they have to assume the risk. But ECB must have done a calculation. Within the next three years, the risk for Italy to go for default is almost zero. The reason is very simple. If you do your calculation, I did it. The new funding requirement for Italy this year will be 340 billion euros. Okay? Even assuming the interest rate, the bond yields at 7%, Italy probably is forced to pay about 400 basis points more. Because it, it was entirely wrong for Italy, for the Italian bonds to trade at the same level as German bonds as it was two years ago. That doesn't make any sense. So at equilibrium, I think Italian debt should have something like 4% interest rates, given it's a structure problem. So you are already paying three, maybe 350 basis point above what you should pay. So the net increase in debt service costs in Italy is going to be less than 1% GDP. So there's no problem for them to, to service the debt this year and next year. So that's why I think ECB is trying to buy at least three years of safe time so that it would allow those governments to restructure the public finances. At the same time, with this repo operation, you basically removed 
systemic risk. There's no bank. I, I can't imagine a bank would fail under that scheme. Think about it. If you half of your balance sheet is, is distressed debt, you, you, you shove them to the ECB, and you take in the free cash, you cannot, you cannot fail. I mean, even if your depositor wants to take your money, no problem. Look at free reserves, the ECBs. If you look at the banking system excessive reserves, it's gone through the roof. It's about $800 billion more right now. They take the money, they redeposit back to the ECB. That is a substantial firepower fending off. That is allowing all the banking system to fend off any liquidation or pressure on their balance sheet. So that's why I think the ECB has achieved both objective of maintaining financial stability at the same time, sustaining the pressure on the government through the bond market to continue to restructure. If you look at it, bond yield, Italian, Italian bond yield stopped going up. The yield stopped going up. It's basically stabilized at a, something like a 7%. Done a fantastic job. So that operation actually is very simple. It's a quantitative easing. It has to be very good for risk assets. And it has to be bearish on the euro. That's what I want everybody, uh, everybody to remember. That's my first point. The second point is on the US economy. Um, how it's going to perform this year. The reason that we have to care about the U.S. economy is very simple. If the U.S. economy is going into another recession, then the earnings are going to collapse. The stock market is going to go down, period. But if the U.S. economy continues to grow, then earnings will continue to expand. And then at some point, stock prices will have to reflect that. Every time when I talk about the U.S. economy, my clients, including my colleagues, always throw me a big word, deleveraging. The US economy is deleveraging how possible the economy can do any better. It's very intuitive, because the US economy is in debt. It is indeed heavily leveraged. Of course, you have to face a deleveraging pressure. But the key point here is this. Deleveraging actually also means a very simple thing. What does it mean? It means that everybody has to save more, spend less, so that you can conserve income and then you pay down your debt. That's what deleveraging is all about. It can't mean anything else. It means save more, spend less, so that you can pay down your debt. That's what deleveraging is all about. If you look at the US economy here, this is a household sector savings rate, the first chart. There was a big jump at the, uh, during the recession. You can see the savings rate rose from 1% to 8%. Well, that's a huge jump. After the recession has ended, there's no clear evidence that they keep saving more. Because if the US consumers keep saving more, keep spending less, the US economy will always be in recession because 75% of the US economy is consumption. Savings rate actually is coming off a bit. In other words, the problem for the US economy is not on the spending side. Because when you talk about deleveraging, you're really referring to the situation where the problem for the economy occurred in the spending side. I'm telling you here, the problem in the US economy is not on the spending side. Because there's no evidence of a continued increase in savings rate. So if the problem is not on the spending side, the slowdown in the US economy, especially the slowdown since the second half of last year, must have occurred on the income side. When you think about income growth, you're really talking about two components. For any economy, an income growth consists of two parts. The first part is productivity, the second part is labor force growth. This two thing gives you income growth. Now, look at this picture. The first, the first chart is long-term productivity growth in the United States. You can see that there's, there has been a massive upswing in productivity growth beginning since the beginning of 1980s. And also this big long-term sw upward swing 
happened in two spurts. The first spurt of productivity gains really took place in the early part of 1980s, and the second spurt in productivity growth took place in the second half of 1990s. What happened back then? In the 1980s, in the early part of 1980s, it was supply-side reform. Reagan and Thatcher came to power. They started to destroy the unions. They started to introduce labor market flexibility. They cut taxes. They have done, they deregulated. They've done everything to boost productivity. And then indeed, we had a first initial surge in labor productivity growth in the United States. The second spurt productivity gain occurred in the latter part of the 1990s. What happened back then? The investment boom in technology. We had a massive boom in technology. We invested a lot of money. Of course, we overinvested and eventually become a bubble and the bubble burst. But in hindsight, in hindsight, that big investment boom in technology really generated and lifted US labor productivity massively. Since then, we don't have that major catalyst for productivity growth. Of course, we had another investment boom in the second half of the last decade, but the investment boom really took place in commercial, in, in residential market that has done nothing to increase your productivity growth. So it looks to me that productivity growth in the US, the secular trend has been settling down to a range of maybe 2% per annum. That's probably what you are looking at going, future, going forward. The second component of, of income growth, the second component of GDP growth is labor force. If you look at the second chart here, there is a structural downshift in labor force growth. In the 70s, the labor force growth contributed about 2.5% of GDP growth, and then that contribution came down to about 1.5% in the 80s and 90s. And in recent decades, we're talking about 0.5%. So there's a structural downshift in labor force growth. Now, the picture all of a sudden becomes very clear. So what is the trend line income growth in the United States? 2% productivity growth plus 0.5% labor force growth. So give you about 2.5% steady state income growth or steady state GDP growth. That will be your trend line gro growth. Now, I want to make a case, because everybody is so bearish, so pessimistic. I want to make a case where the next, well, this year, 2012, we could do better than trend line growth. We could do better than 2.5%. I'm looking at a 3%, maybe slightly better than a 3%. The reason I'm saying that is because of this. Let me explain what this, what this is all about. Housing sector. The housing investment is a high beta component of the U.S. economy. In history, every time when you have a business cycle recovery, the housing investment always supercharge the business cycle recovery. It's always making the business cycle recovery above its trend. That's the beta. That's the thing that push the activities above its it's a trend line. You look at the history. Every time you have a recovery, the contribution of housing sector, the, the middle panel here, the bars, was always in positive. It was always in positive. This time around, the housing sector has been a drag. The housing sector basically not only did not generate any additional growth for the economy, but actually has been canceling out has been canceling out the strength of the other components of the economy. Now, the good news is that drag is diminishing. I don't need, I don't think housing investment is going to turn around. It's probably going to stay flat for a long period of time. But I do not need the housing investment to turn around. I just need it to be flat so that the drag disappearing. You don't cancel other components of the economy. You don't cancel the strength of other components of the economy. As long as you can do that, your growth rate will be better than expected. That's why I think the case for a better than 2.5% growth next year will be actually strengthening as we speak. China. 
I just, you probably heard Mr. Gels, I won't say anything more than that. I'll just give you my uh, uh, two cents uh, of take on, on the Chinese economy, because everybody talking about hard landing, soft landing, whatever landing. Uh, the reality is that you have to remember, for the last year and a half, the Chinese government has been tightening policy. They want to slow down the economy. If the economy doesn't slow, I think the story will be, well, the Chinese government is losing control. The economy is out of control. If the economy is slowing, it's going to be hard landing. Either way, the Chinese government cannot get it right. But in reality, they are more or less getting it right. I think the story is very simple. If you look at the second panel here, the inflation will fall and will fall very hard in China. That will pave the way for a new reflation cycle. They are, they are already beginning to cut reserve requirement. I think the interest rate will come off. I think the reserve requirement will, will be reduced and a new reflation cycle will take place in China and there'll be no hard landing. If you do your simple math, I keep telling, remind, reminding people, if you think about borrowing costs in China, it's about 7%, nominal terms, 7 to 8%. Nominal GDP expansion is probably 13% a year. Even if you are mentally retired, you'll be able to make money as long as they can get a loan. Because you are paying out 7% and you are collecting 13, you make 500 basis points without using any part of your brain. That's why I think the natural tendency for that economy is to borrow, to invest, and to accelerate. My bet is first half of this year, the Chinese economy will continue to soften. The second half of the year, the economy is going to re-accelerate. So the story for China this year, again, is a reflation and re-acceleration. The final thing that I have to go through is what we do as an investor. If you think about the stock market last year, the market actually tumbled 20% followed by a 20% rally. The market really went crazy. And then you, you're going to step back and think about, you know, what has really changed in terms of the economy? Actually, nothing has really changed. The earnings still expanding. But stock prices are lower. The P-E ratio is lower. The reason for that, that has happened was because of the final panel here. Look at the, the risk, equity risk premium. Equity risk premium just shot up. People are concerned. Risk assessment has changed. People are concerned, remember, during the summer, people were concerned, double dip recession in the US. People were concerned about credit downgrade. People were concerned about Euro debt crisis. People were concerned about the Chinese hard lending. They all happened during that period of time. All of a sudden, nobody want to pay. Nobody want to pay more for earnings. Everybody want to pay less, that's why the equity risk premium has gone through the roof. So what do we do this year? Very simple. If you look at the red line here, this is the equity to bond ratio. It's a total return in stocks divided by total return in bonds. The message here is very simple. A recession has been discounted already by the, bond, by, by the stock market and bond market. If you look at the equity bond ratio, it's already fallen to the level that is consistent with a mild recession. If I'm correct that the US is not going to go into a recession, buy stocks, sell bonds. Very simple, won't make you money. I think stocks are cheap, but I think junk bonds, the US junk bonds are cheaper. If you think about total returns in stocks, your expected long-term in common stocks in the U.S. is probably about, probably about, about, about 6 percent. Four and a half percent nominal GDP growth plus one and a half percent dividend yields, that give you about 6 percent, right? More or less, long-term. Junk bond today, yield on junk bonds are close to 9 percent. Of course, you have to take into consideration of corporate default rate and recovery rate. If you look at a his historical average, the corporate default rate 
in this space, in the junk space, is about 4%. The recovery rate is about 60%. So you have to knock off another maybe a, a point, maybe, maybe 1.6 to 2% from 9%. That gives you total expected return from the junk. About 7%. It's still better than stocks. Now, look at this. The blue line is total return in junk. The red line is S&P 500. The story is very, is very simple. If you bought junk at the bottom, you are better off comparing with if you bought stock at the bottom. Not only in absolute return terms, but at a very reduced price volatility because if one is fixed income, the other one is at common shares. So you've got to get a lot higher returns with a lot less price volatility. I think that performance going forward will be repeated. We just went through the math. So if you have extra cash, buy some junks. Commodities, I think the story is very simple. If you look at a commodity, we had a tough time last year. The reason is that the Chinese are tightening. If you look at the lines here, this is Chinese money supply. Basically, Chinese money supply dictates the commodity prices. If I'm right that this is a reflation year for China, interest rate will come down, money supply will go up, then it should be good for commodities. Very simple. Uh, this is just tell you to get rid of bonds. This is not interesting. The euro. I think the quantitative easing is unambiguously bearish for the euro. If you look at the balance sheet of ECB, it expanded 800 billion euros, I just said that, in a day. And then February 13th, they're going to do a second tranche unlimited repo. I think the total expansion after that could well exceed a trillion euros. It's much more aggressive than the Fed QE2. The Fed QE2 expanded balance sheet by 25%. Well, the repo, the first day of repo, ECB's balance sheet has gone up 46%. So we're increasing supply, euro supply. It's going to be bearish for euro. But I think the way to play the euro weakness is through the Japanese yen. You want to buy yen and shorting the euro. The reason is I think the euro, if euro comes down too hard against the dollar, the Fed may counter the action by a, another round of QE. Because the Fed, the US, they, the Americans, they don't like a strong dollar. Whereas you have to figure out a government that who doesn't care, a stupid government that does, that does not care about a strong currency, which is the Japanese. So not only that, but also if you think about it, the yen actually has been depreciating over the last two decades through price decline. They have gone through a lengthy period of real depreciation. The Japanese yen is actually pretty cheap. If you look at the PPP, the Japanese yen, the second panel, the PPP relative value between the yen and the euro, the Japanese yen is still very cheap. The euro is still very expensive. That's what I'm saying. The good way to play the euro weakness is to long the Japanese yen, short the euro. The final thing is gold. Um, a lot of people saying the bull market in gold is, is, is dead. I, 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 I have certain sympathy to that view because if you look at the first chart here, there are basically two things behind the gold bull market. One is the dollar. If dollar goes down, it's got to be good for gold because gold is expressed in dollars, so dollar going down. Gold price is going up. I am not bearish on the dollar anymore. So you probably remove one lag of the bull market. But there is another lag of the bull market that is still standing there, which is the second chart here. You look at the red line here. The red line is the money over GDP ratio. We are still printing, creating a lot of fiat money. We're really living in a world of competitive devaluation. If you think about it, the, the ECB is doing it, trying to drive down the euro. If euro is going down too fast, the 
probably the Fed is going to do another round of QE, driving down the dollar. So in the end, if you have a competitive devaluation, no currency will be devalued. Because the currency is always relative gains. So in the end, remember, the competitive devaluation will not lead to a general decline in currency because you can't. The only thing will be revalued will be the quasi-monetary standard. You're going to end up with a lot of fiat money and probably rising gold prices. I don't think this game is over yet. The ECB is, is onto it. So you probably want to buy some gold if prices come coming off a little bit more. That's, that's my bet. That basically concludes my talk. I think we covered almost everything. Thank you, St. Chow, for an interesting presentation and a great closing presentation on our conference. We might have time for a question or two. I should add, what we especially like is you gave some good giveaways for our institutional investors here right, also. Right. Yeah, that's good. No great. questions. Ah, uh, that can be true. That cannot be true. I'll, <laughs> I'll pop a question for you. Don't worry. Sure. <laughs> well, 2011, we've seen a lot of uh, shocks in a way. Social unrest, for example. There was an earthquake yeah. in Japan. That is to be expected at times. We just don't know when. There are also a Middle East revolt, and we have seen the 99% movement in the US. Mm. Do you think these scenarios could be impacted by a lot of social unrest in 2012 and, uh, and a lot of unforeseen events that take away the growing confidence of the markets? I think 2000, 2012 will be very interesting because it's a political year. As is, you know, US is going through the election, China will going through the elect power trans tr transition, Russia, French election. You know, there's so many. I don't even remember how many of them. But I think there are a couple of points I want to make. A, the Great Recession in the US has really polarized this, the system. It polarized the political system. If you think about it, you know, there is no middle. There's no middle ground anymore. You know, you either become extremely right, you become extremely left. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, you, you look at the Tea Parties, look at the Republican candidates. I mean, Ron Paul want to destroy the Fed, want to return gold standard. You got all kind of things. No taxes, and then you have the 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 other side of the uh, equation, which is which is the Democrats. They have, you know, Obama actually has pissed off all these. Democrats, they, they said, you know, you, you, just, you just give up too much ground. So uh, I think we will continue to see that. I don't think that's going to change. I think the extremist view in the U.S. become mainstream. That's the dangerous part. Um, I don't know how to predict the future in terms of political implications. Um, it cannot be good. That's why I think we've just focused this year. Beyond this year, I don't know. I mean, anything can happen. Anything goes. I mean, I have no idea. But I think this year, the economic story probably still very much dominant. Can you hear me? Uh, no. Uh, my name is Torleif Jackson. Uh, I have a question for you uh, about uh, Chinese stocks I'm interested in hearing your opinion about uh, Chinese uh, stocks in listed in U.S. and listed in uh, China. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, the valuation and the Chinese economy and, uh, and all the scandals that have been in, uh, in the audits in the U.S. company. Uh, Chinese stocks listed in the U.S. I think about one in ten has been delisted last year. Buy them. You have to do a bit of a due diligence. You don't want to get trapped by some, some fake companies. I mean, we got all, a lot of those. But from the macro perspective, I think the story is very clear. They have been tightening policy for a year and a half. The stock market has suffered as a result. It's a typical response to a monetary tightening cycle. If I'm right, this year they're going to have a reflation. That's the year you want to probably own some Chinese shares. Of course, you don't 
mortgage your house to buy them, but if you have some extra cash, uh, throw a few bucks there, I think it probably you're going to do better than other markets. Is that, is, that, is that good enough? Okay. Thank you, Chen. Thank I you. think we will, um, that was the last question. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Mm.